London of the 18th century, during the reign of George II, provided the inspiration for the satire of William Hogarth. Master painter though he was, the genius of Hogarth was expressed in his engravings. Through his prints, he became both the social historian and the recreator of the comedy of British life. Hogarth's subjects were authentic. He was familiar with every club, tavern, and lane of the city. No politician, impoverished aristocrat, Drury Lane Bell, or Mary Andrew escaped his critical appraisal. In 1750, he recomposed the scandalous March to Finchley. The troops of King George II were moved toward an encampment at Finchley after a rumor was heard that the young pretender's army was approaching. The march, as depicted by Hogarth, occurs on Tottenham Court Turnpike. A delightful diversion of the time was the theater, and Hogarth had many associations with it. On occasion, his immensely popular engraved stories such as the Harlot's Progress of 1732, were plagiarized and converted into stage productions. But if the stage profited from the artist's originality, Hogarth in turn accepted the influence of the theater. In writing of his prints, he acknowledged, I wish to compose pictures similar to representations on the stage and further hope that they will be tried by the same test and criticized by the same criterion. The famous Southwark Fair. As the artist's actors surge through the fairgrounds, the action is defined and controlled by the buildings which serve as theatrical sets. Hogarth also refers to the current popularity of the theater 
by introducing several entertaining companies of itinerant or strolling players. Their playbill banners. This troupe presents the Siege of Troy, a parody of that famous story of antiquity and a favorite at such fairs of the time. The normal hubbub of the Southwark Fair is intensified by Hogarth. And comic tragedy strikes the actors of Sibber's company. London of the 18th century was a city of social inequalities, of immorality, of filth and poverty. It provided the artist with material for many of his moral subjects, among them the famous Gin Lane. He created this imaginary but symbolic street to show the degradation of the poor who fall victims to gin while seeking escape from their miseries. Gin addicts offer their last possessions to the prosperous pawnbroker, S. Gripe. Full barrels line the flourishing gin mill. An intoxicated woman neglects her child. suicide and violence. A neat coffin maker's sign. An actual person, Sir John Gunson, a magistrate known and feared for his relentless apprehension of wayward girls. Sir John and his men enter the chamber of the fictitious Mary Hackabout, the ill-fated heroine of the Harlot's Progress. Hackabout shall be arrested by Sir John and started on her way to Bridewell Prison.
Bridewell Prison and other recognizable monuments of British architecture helped to create the impression that Hogarth's comedies were contemporary and local occurrences. In the Rake's Progress of 1735, Hogarth tells the story of a profligate young man. Young Rakewell has already wasted the inheritance from his miserly father as he vainly tries to affect the manners of a gentleman. To recoup his fortunes, he submits to a marriage with a wealthy but middle-aged and one-eyed widow. The ceremony is in the church of St. Mary Le Bon, situated at the time on what were then the outskirts of London. Above the poor box, Hogarth places a bronze plaque inscribed and signed by two church wardens of the time, which testifies to the good state of repair of the building. The church was actually in such condition that it was torn down and rebuilt only six years after the print was published. Hogarth's storytelling through sequences of related prints produced a novel innovation in the history of satirical graphics. Such was the series of 1745 entitled Marriage a la Mode. A parlor in the mansion of Viscount Squanderfield. The nobleman, financially embarrassed, is driven into a contractual agreement with a penny-pinching but wealthy tradesman. Marriage settlement of the Right Honorable Lord Viscount Squanderfield. The document stipulates that the son of the Viscount shall marry the daughter of the tradesman, who is only too willing to trade hard cash for position. Meanwhile, a solicitor's aide presents the mortgage paper and the payments to the nobleman. The master of the mansion is accustomed to luxurious living, a case of gout. The Viscount's nobility is symbolized on every hand. Even his crutches and he wishes that his superior birth and position be appreciated during these pedestrian dealings. The distinguished family tree upon which he is symbolized as a coroneted blossom, a family tree which springs from roots nourished by the body of peerless William the Conqueror. The money will permit the improvement of the holdings of Lord Squanderfield. An architect studies a blueprint inscribed, a plan of the new building of the Right Honorable Lord Viscount. By telescoping time, Hogarth indicates that the construction of a great residence is well along. Lawyer Silvertongue, his services completed, pauses to converse with the bride-to-be, and on her kerchief, her uncherished engagement ring. Young Squanderfield ignores his fiancée and takes a pinch of snuff. Chained together, Hogarth's reference to a prearranged wedlock, a marriage of fashion in which love has no part. Early morning, 
in the new residence of the young Viscount and his wife. cap Reference to the authority on the rules of gaming, which are followed according to Hoyle. A ledger. Bills. Young Squanderfield goes to the office of a quack where Hogarth ridicules the medical profession. In a cabinet. The horn of a mythical unicorn whose particles were used by quacks for centuries for the preparation of miraculous potions. a machine for the mass production of worthless pills. The unfaithful Viscount has acquainted himself with wayward women, for which he is suffering. He berates the quack for his ineffective cures. Procurus finds the remarks of Squanderfield offensive. The physician gathers his wits for a retort. Lady Squanderfield's social program of the day includes the customary morning levee. To run no risk of unbearable boredom, no pause in the day is permitted. The operatic tenor Carastini fills the chamber with sweet sound. And in response to the harmonies, The social obligations of the young couple are many. Lady Squander's company is desired at Miss Harebrain's rout. Lady Squander's company is desired at Lady Townley's drum, Monday next. Lawyer Silvertongue, now one of the circle, seeks the promise of Lady Squanderfield to attend a masquerade, a favorite diversion of the time a ticket to the event. He points to the painted screen where the pleasures of such a masquerade are illustrated. Hogarth places among the treasures of the household a famous masterpiece of Renaissance painting, The Myth of Jupiter and Io by Correggio. A 
merry jolla mode begins to reach its inevitable end in the Turks Head Inn, where at the conclusion of the evening's entertainment, Lady Squanderfield and Lawyer Silvertongue have withdrawn. <laughs> Viscount, suspecting his wife's unfaithfulness, has broken into the room and fallen into mortal duel with Silvertongue. Lady Squanderfield, overcome with remorse, begs forgiveness. Silvertongue flees. The innkeeper and a night watchman drawn by the sounds of conflict. Above the door, a painting portrays the patron saint of the Guild of Artists, St. Luke, with his winged bull. To this saintly artist, Hogarth has assigned the task of setting down a pictorial record of the sad events below. The moralistic tale is concluded with the return of Lady Squanderfield to the home of her father. The household is in marked contrast to the lavish residences of the Squanderfields. Its few ornaments are minor still life or genre paintings, choices of the bourgeois taste of the self-made merchant. The lady has committed suicide by drinking laudanum. The empty vial now rests beside a manuscript inscribed Counselor Silvertongue, his dying speech. An apothecary berates his stupid boy who has not arrived with the proper antidotes in time to save the life of Lady Squanderfield, a consequence which has robbed him of the opportunity for further sales of medications. The household's miserable hound finds in the confusion the opportunity for one rewarding meal. The father, whose thoughts of his daughter are neither of forgiveness nor affection, is concentrated upon the removal of a ring from her still warm hand. Like most artists who treat with satire through visual means, Hogarth found the graphic arts the principal medium by which he could reach a widespread and public audience. Although the character and actions of his subjects were overdrawn to satisfy his critical purposes, the basic truth of men's conduct is similar to that found in the comedy of life of any age.